Hey, this is Professor Wham doing a short kind of follow up uh, to my three part contact with colliding worlds. I'm calling this part four ish, uh, a coda, if you will. That's an old musical term for a little bit at the end. And that's kind of what this is about. Um, and this came about as a result of a recent interview that I did with Barbara Fisher for her Six Degrees of John Keel podcast, which when I get the link from her when she publishes that interview, um, I'll link that to the blog. But she hasn't published it yet, so I'll do that when I get it. I took her advice to go ahead and read this expanded edition of Valley and Harris's book, Trinity, The Best Kept Secret. Now, the book does have some fascinating extra information in it, which this short presentation will make clear, making it worth getting first before you invest in the first edition. So if you haven't purchased this book yet, just get the second edition, even though it has a stupid cover. You know, some, some editor decided to go on holiday and let somebody else design this. Um, and if you have the first edition, go ahead and get this edition at least on Kindle, it's, it's got good information in it. It's worth it. Now, the main editions are in the latter part of the book. I did actually go through the books chapter by chapter, and I did notice there were some ex extra bits that were in some of the other chapters. But the main additional information is found towards the end in an extra chapter 18, which details the team's finding of a fifth witness uh, an individual named Fastino Myers, who was an older youth at the time when the when the crash took place. Um, he's Sabrina's cousin, and he was raised by Jose Padilla's father, so he was present when Sabrina was there. Uh, by the time Sabrina was there, which was in the early 50s, uh, he was a young man. And in fact, I believe had either gotten engaged or married by that time. He had like a separate living situation on the ranch. But he had clear memories of the angel hair, hair materials that had been so prominently mentioned by the other witnesses. He didn't remember the other uh, materials. He didn't have firsthand access to them, but he did to the angel hair, angel hair materials. Now, he had not known of this investigation prior to being contacted by the team and had never really spoken of these materials prior to the study, except maybe to his wife. As with Sabrina, he was located after strenuous background checking and rechecking by Harris. So, um, you know, whatever you may think of her in other contexts, she has done an extraordinary amount of work to locate extra witnesses for this study. So kudos to her, you know, even if you don't particularly care for her in other places. His description, or Fastino's description of the materials, tallied closely with that of Jose and Sabrina, um, with some additional information about the color of the glowing light that seemed to emanate from the material. Um, it seemed to possibly be emanating from the ultraviolet spectrum, and its physical composition. It was in bunches, not strings. The reason this is important is that both of these things were, were mentioned by Sabrina, um, but then were confirmed by Faustino, and they had not had contact with each other about these materials, you know, for decades. Another fascinating aside recounted in the book is clear evidence of an attempt at witness tampering by an unknown agent who phoned Sabrina prior to one of her scheduled interview sessions with Harris. Now, this unknown person claimed to be a member of the valet Harris team and told Sabrina that for personal reasons, Harris was going to be unable to meet with her for their scheduled interviews, and this was a lie. Harris found out about this call when she phoned in order to confirm that meeting. Now, obviously, no one knows who placed the call, and as Valet pu puts it, any number of intelligence services or, frankly, cranks or hackers at this point can do this sort of thing, so he advised Harris and the team to ignore it, which they did, and there were no more reported incidences, at least uh, as of the publishing of this book. Now, Valet uses some observations of Canadian UFO investigator Wilbert Smith 
to craft an even more expansive conclusion to this edition of Trinity. While the Falcon Lake case that I mentioned in my review of Trinity in part two of my series still doesn't appear in Valet's Roundup, Smith's comments reflect physical materials that the Canadian government had collected prior to the Falcon Lake incident. The Falcon Lake incident occurs, I believe, in 1967, and Smith's comments uh, that, uh, that Valet is quoting um, happen at a press conference in 1958 and then again in 1961. So they were actually prior to the Falcon Lake incident. But still Valet is able to use Smith's comments during this press conference to, and this is in 1958, to demonstrate that whatever secrets, quote, might be known, unquote, about these kinds of events are either held at levels so above top secret that they are not even known in regular intelligence government circles or are so compartmentalized within existing agencies that it may be impossible to ever access them. And when talking about this, uh, Valet is actually referencing some of the work, um, com work and comments made by um, Philip Corso, who some of you might be familiar with. In other words, the vaunted goal of disclosure may itself be part of the game alphabet agencies play with themselves and with us. Now, as a final note to this ongoing chapter, I'll briefly mention that I recently received an email from a colleague with a link to an online series called The Superhumanities. In week two of that series, there was a roundtable which featured Whit Whitley, Stryber, Diana Walsh, Pasulka, Jeffrey Creepel, and John Philip Santos, who various of, of you will probably know those names. A little over 40 minutes into the event, Santos basically expresses the same event synchronicities over time and space with regard to the Trinity explosion. Let's follow Valet and not call it a test, as I do in my part one of this series. So it's nice to know that the old brain inside my head is still making the important connections. Fame is not necessary for one to be basically correct, or at least thoughtful. And this is my anti-academic poke at the institutions. Now what I'm going to do is read a little bit from the conclusion and epilogue of Trinity so that you can kind of get a sense of how Valet is ending this part of his investigation. Um, I'm obviously not going to read you all of it because you need to read the book yourself, but uh, this is to give you a sense of, of how some of my conclusions and some of his conclusions sort of dovetail. So this is towards the end of his conclusion. He does redo parts of his conclusion as a result of this, the extra materials, of course, that they found, the extra interview and that sort of thing. He says here, um, Today we do have extremely sophisticated systems in orbit and in the outer reaches of the solar system, but the basic contradictions in physics that existed in 1945 have not been resolved, so the technology we use to overcome gravity still rests on the same propulsive concept as the rockets invented by Chinese physicists 5,000 years ago. What we teach in aerospace graduate courses at Stanford and MIT is nothing more than the application of, more or less, controlled chemical reactions to generate thrust with computer guidance and modern materials. The question nobody seems to ask is, what if those UFO devices had been designed so they could not be reverse engineered by people with our current level of knowledge and social development? What if their target was at a different level, at a symbolic level, about our relationship to life, at a psychic level, about our relationship to the universe? What if they contained an existential warning? Now, at that point, he references a paper that he and Dr. Eric Davis published in 2003 titled Incommensurability, Orthodoxy, and the Physics of High Strangeness, a Six-Layer Model for Anomalous Phenomena, a paper which I will recommend to you and which is available online at Jacques Vallée's website. Um, and, uh, and essentially, he says, um, 
this book is an attempt to answer some of the questions presented in that paper. And then he says, what if the object, and this is the avocado object that crashed at San Antonito, what if the object was a product of a form of information physics, which is a science in gestation, rather than simply a physical vehicle? What if it was both physical and, for lack of a better word, psychic? Because keep in mind, no one knows actually what happened to those beings that Jose and Rime saw. What was it doing depositing weird telepathic creatures at an ancient traditional site one month to the day after mankind's first large-scale historic liberation of the atom? Was it a direct answer to our discovery of nuclear forces? The hopeful beginning of a dialogue? A message? Was it packaged in such a way that it would trigger the kind of reaction an external actor might need, a forced opening of our minds, the opportunity to set aside our arrogance and to listen to other forms of consciousness so we could be clearly presented with the flimsy parameters of our survival, or a signal from the point of view of better scientists somewhere that our survival may not be an inflexible requirement for the universe. And then this is from the epilogue. We don't pretend to have unveiled the full significance of what happened near San Antonito. Was the object an extraterrestrial craft? If so, it lacks the accoutrements modern technology would normally associate with such a craft, primary among them, a life support system and space navigation equipment. Was it a decoy or a warning from another country? If so, why were the occupants so radically different from known Earth creatures? And what about the projected visions? What about the weird properties of the materials? All we can say is that this event has taken its place within the tapestry of numerous well-observed cases with hard, measurable traces and trustworthy witnesses like Socorro and Valensole, cases that have remained unidentified after all official inquiries by responsible government and scientific agencies were exhausted. Although pointedly ignored by academic scientists, these incidents are rich with images that have been subliminally injected into our collective psyche and actually amplified by the studious neglect of our leading intellectuals. They still work inside of us today, and they continue to impact human consciousness through the worldwide media hinting at cosmic truths. We ignore them at our peril because of the pressing enigma those undeniable cases present. The story of the Trinity UFO crash remains as a document in human history that we must keep reading without ever the luxury of firmly turning the page and closing the book.